<laughs> Welcome all as, as you come in here. Uh, we'll get started in just one minute uh, to let everybody arrive. Uh, we're, we're excited to have you here for the American Security Projects uh, event on Beneath the Waves, a deeper look at the national security threats of illicit phishing highlighted in sea piracy, sea spiracy. Uh, we're excited to, to be with you as I just see participants still coming in. So we'll wait one more minute. Uh, and uh, I'd encourage all participants on the line to uh, use the Q&A function uh, to ask questions and answers today. We're gonna use that as our way of, of having a discussion. Uh, our format today is we'll first hear from Congressman Peter Welch of Vermont. We're excited to have him with us. And then we're going to turn it over to our panel uh, featuring uh, Admiral William Fallon, a board member of the American Security Project, and then uh, Alex Cornelison and Peter Hammerstead from Sea Shepherd, and Ali and Lucy Tabrizi, the directors of Seaspiracy. We're excited to, to get started. Uh, Looks like we've got a pretty good list of participation here. So uh, we'll go ahead. Congressman Welch, it's, it's an honor to have you with us. Uh, and we're happy to, to be talking about this. Congressman Peter Welch has represented Vermont, Vermonters in Congress since 2007. Uh, in an era of partisanship and division, he is widely recognized as a skillful legislature, legis legislator who, who cultivates governing over gridlock. Uh, Representative Welch is a leading advocate for energy efficiency, cutting the price of prescription drugs, investing in infrastructure, and expanding broadband and telemedicine in rural America. He serves as chief De deputy whip for the House Democratic Congress and is a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. He's also a member of the House Intelligence Committee and the Oversight and Reform Committee. Uh, illicit fishing does, can fall under the Energy and, and Commerce Committee, and we're excited to have him with us. Congressman Welch, over to you. Thanks thanks for being with the American Security Project today. Well, I'm really delighted uh, to be with the American Security Project. I'm uh, really delighted also to be with the folks who have done so much uh, to present this film and to produce this film that uh, people are going to see later, Seaspiracy. <clears throat> you know, I want to make a, a confession uh, about my ignorance uh, on this topic. And you know, I have served on the Energy and Commerce Committee for a number of years, and I'm totally and completely uh, committed to addressing climate change. I did not know, uh, among other things, about how uh, the way we're treating the oceans and the illegal fishing and the mechanisms of that uh, in the human toll, all the things that will be discussed later. I, d I did not realize how profound, how profound the connection between our climate and the health of the sea is. And if we just extrapolate that, where I'm a person who is really interested in addressing climate issues, but was largely ignorant about the crucial role that healthy seas play in the survival of our planet, you can only imagine uh, how much this story needs to be told uh, to not just the American people, but the people of the world. You know, when I was talking earlier, when we were preparing to Admiral Fallon, and uh, of course, I'm really excited about his participation, look forward to hearing him, but he's been all over the oceans and mentioned to me something that just uh, run, rang true, and that is what's going on out there in the oceans, unseen, unknown by all of us, is similar to what was happening in the West in our country um, when we were slaughtering uh, all of the wildlife out there, the buffalo, and nobody knew it. It was needless, it was heedless, it was damaging, but none of us knew it. So the work that the American Security Project is doing and um, all of you at Sea Shepherd, uh, the educational value of the film Sea Spiracy uh, to bring the focus of attention on what is happening and steps that we can take to stop it from happening 
uh, is really profoundly important. And it's actually, in, it's a project where if we undertake it and there is awareness and knowledge, we can do something about it. But what I saw in the work of the, uh, of the, of the American Security Project and also uh, Sea Shepherd in the film that I watched are just the profoundly important reasons why we have to be involved. I mentioned the environmental, there's the human rights. So much of this illegal unreported and unregistered fishing uh, is a massive exploitation of human labor. So much of what happens also uh, is threatening the species of so many uh, of our fish that has to stop, not just because it's wanton and wrong, but as I mentioned, because it's important to the survival of the oceans in the reefs. And the issue of this illegal fishing, especially with the deep water, uh, the distant water fishing uh, that's so uh, dominant in China is an extraordinary national security threat. Uh, and uh, we'll be hearing from Admiral Fallon on that, but who better uh, to describe uh, the chaos that it can, can ensue, where you basically have a lawless situation uh, that is allowed to continue, and we don't have a means of addressing it. And again, that's where a Sea Shepherd comes in. How do you, as a country, coordinate the work that is normally done by a Navy, which focuses on uh, security, uh, and uh, uh, something like a Coast Guard, where there would be much more, fo more focus on uh, some of the illegal fishing. And one, for many countries, this illegal fishing has been out of sight, out of mind. And we can't allow that. Uh, in Congress, uh, there is a growing concern about uh, the issue. Now, a lot of it is really around the national security threat. Uh, and it was mentioned by Andrew, I serve on the Intelligence Committee. Uh, so we get these briefings about some of these incidents uh, that are occurring and are very, very threatening. So uh, I just want to express uh, my support uh, for the advocacy here to establish a great deal of energy to try to address the security issues human rights issues and the environmental issues that are associated with the illegal unreported and unregistered fishing, the use of these uh, fishing, uh, industrial style uh, fishing, where there's just a slaughter of fish that aren't even the ones that are intended to be caught, uh, but where as a result of capturing and killing them, we're doing untold and irreparable potentially damage to the sea. Uh, and uh, I wanna just congratulate uh, all the folks who've been involved. So Admiral Fallon, I'm gonna look forward to listening to you. I wanna thank Alex, uh, the CEO of Sea Shepherd and uh, uh, Peter, uh, I enjoyed your comments uh, as I watched Sea Spiracy. And uh, Ali and Lucy, how, how in the world did you do that? That's what I wanna know, what an extraordinary, uh, commitment and effort and accomplishment. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing to me, and it must be, a, it's a tribute to you that it's one of the top trending uh, films on, uh, on, on Netflix right now. It gives me some heart because people want to know what is happening and you're helping us understand that. So uh, thank you very much. And I uh, will stop there and look forward to hearing from other people and take questions if that's part of uh, what you'd like to do at the moment. Congressman, thank you. Yes, it, I have a, a couple of questions here that I'm uh, from the audience that I'll, I'll uh, pass on to you. And um, this is an interesting one from uh, Rourke Newton it says, do you, have, do you have any expectation that the US government will target illicit fishing, unreported illegal fishing for the environmental aspects or only ever for national security issues? Um, in many ways, I think maybe it doesn't matter uh, what, what the motivation is, but uh, you know, what do you think about how the U.S. government can, can do something on this and the motivation behind why they do it? 
Well, first of all, you know, the American Security Project <clears throat> with uh, uh, se se former Secretary Kerry mm -hmm. uh, and, and former Senator H Defense Secretary Hagel. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're both committed environmentalists and they have both uh, committed their lives to the national security of our country. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not an either or proposition. And uh, of course, Secretary Kerry now having his new position, essentially as our, uh, as our ambassador on climate change, there's a full recognition that to deal with climate change, it has to be international, but it's, he is doing this job from the perspective of a person that understands how actual processes, industrial fishing uh, has an impact on the quality of the oceans and then the quality of the oceans has a profound impact on the quality of the state of carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in fact, uh, the, with the leadership that we have, I think they will get it that it's both national security and, um, and environmental. You know, at the outset, the reason I acknowledge my own ignorance of this is because the members of Congress and I'm, I, I'd be representative, and actually I'm much more environmentally focused than many of my colleagues, but we need to be hearing the story so that we can feel the urgency of it. And there's always a quicker response to say a national security threat, an incident in the South China Sea, let's say, uh, that then gets members to hopefully support some international uh, agreements that abate that potential uh, uh, incident escalating into actual hostilities. Uh, but there's so many um, of my colleagues who also come from a uh, perspective of protecting wildlife, of, 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 of wanting to protect habitat. And, and they've got to, we've all got to be educated into what we don't see. And that's the seas that are well beyond the horizon. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that that's exactly right. And, and one, a lot of the work that the American Security Project does is about connecting the environmental issues with national security issues and uh, American competitiveness issues, scientific leadership issues. All of these things, you know, may not be specifically seen as national security issues, but but in reality, they are. You know, they, exactly. The quality of our environment is no no less of a national security challenge than you know, a bomber or a, a battleship. Uh, I, I have one one more question uh, that I wanted to, to put to you, and it, it's specifically pick, picking this one because uh, it's a state representative from your neighboring state of Connecticut. Uh, state Representative David Michael, I, I think I'm saying that right, says, thanks very much for your time to speak today. I was wondering if you think our country is ready for a full moratorium on heavy gear industrial and commercial fishing fleets. I don't. I mean, this issue hasn't been discussed uh, at the level of consciousness and awareness for people who get to uh, 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 discussing that as a remedy. So we're not there yet. Uh, and we're not there yet in part because we're not educated and aware. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why that analogy that Admiral Fallon made to me about the West, uh, I found so riveting. Um, you know, all of that was happening out West uh, a century ago or a little more, and none of us knew it. And if we had known it, we wouldn't have approved it. You know, you have these hunters, hunters. I mean, that's absurd. They're just, they're in a, in a train coach and they're shooting buffalo outside just for their amusement. And most of America had no clue that was going on. And there's an element of comparability here uh, with these nets that are being used and, and by catch be damned, they don't care. Mm -hmm. So we've got to have the education before we can get to a discussion about uh, the remedy. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think that's right. We, we still have to, we have a long way to go here to, to talk more about this and educate people. Um, so, so thanks, uh, thanks for that. Uh, one, I, one more question, and, and this is uh, very specific towards maybe something more towards your Senate colleagues than, than your House colleagues, but um, there's a question on do you think this administration should, fo should focus on ratifying the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea? 
And can, can this be used to help address the issues here? Now, of course, this is a treaty that sits before the Senate and has for the last 30 plus years. Uh, ASP has actually done a lot of work to, to uh, make the case for, for ratifying UNCLOS. Uh, but do you, do you see any prospect for anything like this uh, in the new administration? You know, I, 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 well, in the administration, I do. Yeah. You know, this uh, we've gone from a, a, an administration that pretends to deny the existence of climate change to one that sees it as an existential threat. Uh, so, it, and also we've gone from an administration that uh, was opposed to uh, international agreements and took an America, uh, America first, America alone approach to an administration that thinks that many of these problems like climate change and the law of the seas have to be international by definition and that we need American leadership uh, to get to that uh, outcome. So I think in the administration, there's definitely uh, support for that. You know, the politics of the Senate, I, I'm not certain. And maybe uh, Admiral Fallon may know more about that, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with, with you and really admire the work you all are doing. Well, Congressman, thank you. And, and uh, we're going to move into, into our panel discussion now. Uh, and, and we welcome you to, to stick with us and, and, and listen in and, and uh, join in. If, if there's anything that, that you want to add on uh, during the, the Q&A here, we'd welcome it. Uh, hey, thank I mean, you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for being with us. And, and you know, in normal times, you'd hear a huge round of applause. But uh, on, on Zoom, it's all, it's all everybody alone. So thanks for being with us, sir. Uh, uh, I'm going to do a quick introduction of all of our panelists at once, uh, and then we're going to go into uh, brief, uh, brief opening remarks from each uh, in this order, uh, and, and then we'll go from there. Um, first up, uh, Admiral William, William Fallon retired from the U.S. Navy after a distinguished 40-year career of military and strategic leadership. He's led U.S. and allied forces in eight separate commands and played a leadership role in military and diplomatic matters at the highest levels of the U.S. government. As head of U.S. Central Command, Admiral Fallon directed all U.S. military operations in the Middle East, Central Asia, Asia, and the Horn of Africa, focusing on combat efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Prior to that, he led U.S. Pacific Command for two years, directing political military activities in the Asia Pacific region. And, and, and it's his time there that uh, he, he gained a, a deep understanding of this issue. He's a board member of the American Security Project and, and we are honored to have him with, with us. Coming to us live from uh, West Africa, Gabon, uh, Captains Alex Cornelison and Peter Hammerstadt uh, are both longtime veterans of the Sea Shepherd Conversa Conservation Society. Uh, this is an international nonprofit with a worldwide presence and a mission to protect marine animals. The mission is to partner with governments from around the world to assist them with the de detection and capture of crim criminal enterprises that are in operation to engage in illegal, unreported, and unregulated unreg fishing operations. Uh, we're really excited that they were able to take some time from their trip uh, to West Africa, where they're, they're working on maintaining these public-private partnerships. Uh, I, I look forward to hearing more about their work there. And then finally, uh, Ali and Lucy Tabrizi are the directors of the Netflix original documentary, Seaspiracy. Uh, Ali grew up on the south, southeast coast of England, while Lucy was born in Melbourne, Australia. But I noted that both of their bi bios mention how much they, they grew up thinking of the sea. And, and you can really take that away uh, in watching, watching the movie, uh, how deeply felt and passionate they are about this issue. Um, the movie has become uh, quite a sensation on, on Netflix around the world, uh, and we're lucky to have them coming to us uh, live from London. Uh, so thanks for being with us all. Uh, Admiral Fallon, we'll start with you. Uh, each of you will give opening remarks, and then we'll go to a Q&A. Sir, over to you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Uh, Congressman, fellow panelists, it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm going to try to make this uh, short and sweet and then get into questions and answers that folks may have. So as Andrew indicated, I spent more than four decades in the Navy all over the world at sea, been in all the oceans of the world. And the particular note, I think uh, I spent a fair amount of time in the high Arctic and also in the Antarctic, 
at one time, uh, Antarctic uh, continent was my responsibility for support for the scientific uh, expeditions that were going on and continue to go on there. So I got a chance to go uh, go around that continent and uh, and see up, up close and personal what, what's going on. Big takeaways I have are this issue of the health of the seas, uh, underlying foot stomp is, is really important. I've watched uh, two major vectors in uh, going in, uh, in the wrong direction. Now, one is the visible accumulation of trash and garbage and the, uh, the most harmful uh, being plastics and the vast majority of that being fishing gear uh, from my observations that are out there floating in the seas and washing up in places. Just as an example, there are uh, this North, so-called North Pacific gyre is a, is a huge uh, cesspool of, of stuff that's accumulated all uh, over years. Uh, the currents have brought it together. And if one were to go to some of the uh, otherwise pristine islands in the North Hawaiian chain, for example, uh, you could see reefs out there that are just completely covered in uh, primarily fishing gear, but all kinds of other plastic waste. And uh, it's really uh, pretty dispiriting to see this kind of thing. Uh, the other, other observation would be the disappearance of marine life, animals, fish, uh, various uh, mammals that uh, inhabit the ocean and the numbers declining dramatically. And uh, these, these very visible things, I believe, are pretty much out of sight, out of mind, for the average person in the world pretty much all, all over the world. A very small percentage of people actually uh, spend their time on the sea. And so uh, I think there's great ignorance of what goes on. And one of the things I'd like to see out of this discussion is to maybe talk about ways to increase awareness of, of the problem, because that, that's where we've got to start. From the national security angle, uh, the reality is that when, uh, when things occur that impact the personal lives of individuals, uh, sooner or later, this escalates up to, to problems that involve the rest of the world. And uh, the way this starts uh, at the most basic level that I see are many of the smaller countries of the world, those that are, uh, that are less industrialized, uh, uh, less advanced, uh, depend on basically subsistence fishing uh, to feed their populations. And that uh, opportunity is disappearing pretty quickly because of the industrialization of many of the, uh, the fishery vessels and the organizations behind these, uh, these huge vessels, which basically sweep and vacuum just about everything out of the sea, any of the living organisms. From the security aspect, uh, I watch uh, a significant amount of over-exploitation. Uh, uh, we can point fingers at a lot of places. Some of them might be a little surprising, but others uh, wouldn't take a lot of thought to figure out who's doing the majority of it. Uh, but uh, the impact here is that uh, to continue their ways of over exploiting the resources, uh, there's a lot of criminal activity involved and a lot of corruption and intimidation. And this involves, particularly for the smaller countries, less resources, uh, less knowledge, uh, a bribe here and there, sometimes significant bribes to turn the other way, allow these uh, fleets to come in and, and vacuum the oceans and then disappear. And so some people may have a few, uh, few dollars in their pocket, but the populations are left with, uh, with a lack of food resource, which they really depend on, just as an example. Uh, so this, unfortunately, is going on every day in the world. And a particular concern to me is that as many parts of our oceans are overfished and, uh, and overexploited, the, uh, those that are desperate to continue this uh, kind of operation are looking to areas that it were heretofore uh, more challenging to reach, for example, the southern seas around Antarctica. But increasingly, uh, these, these areas, I think, are being targeted. And of course, they're, they're unseen. Uh, the vast majority of people have no idea this is going on. So lots of things we could talk about. I think a reality here is that, as with many big issues in the world, this is one that is complex. And so you have uh, myriad things that push and pull. For example, uh, we had a, a major uh, food push in the world to uh, lessen our dependence on animal flesh, for example, and, and what a healthy thing it is to eat fish. And, and that's, that's a great idea. 
until you see what goes on and uh, again, the over exploitation. So you'll have contrasting uh, issues like this that make it difficult to address these things. But I believe it's, it's high time to address them. And we start with awareness. Uh, this movie I hadn't seen until last evening. It's, it's pretty discouraging from the standpoint yeah. of what goes on out there. But uh, back you can come my videos off. Opportunity. Admiral Fallon, you're, you're muted if you want to finish. We've, we've muted, Congressman. Yeah, I just I just muted myself uh, okay. over to, uh, to Alex. And, uh, okay, great. Peter. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Alex and, uh, and Peter, welcome. Thanks for being with us from, from Africa. It's really, we're, uh, we're great to have you with us and, and thanks for all your work. Over to you. Uh, introduce, introduce us to whichever direct, whoever wants to go first. Thank you. Um, thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'll go first, I guess. Sure. Uh, we're here in uh, Gabon, uh, one of the first of our uh, African uh, partner nations where we all started with African campaigns. We currently have uh, eight countries signed up for uh, uh, partnerships, for patrols together with their uh, government uh, agencies, uh, military, uh, fisheries. And we just had a great meeting with three of the ministers here, and we're looking forward to uh, continuing in our work here. I think it's really important to have a documentary like uh, Seaspiracy out there. I mean, it really, I mean, we've been saying this for many, many years. Peter and I have both been sailing for about 20 years, not as long as Admiral Fallon, Admiral Fallon but we have also seen the, uh, yeah, the destruction and the diminishment of species. Uh, it is really, what you're seeing in Seaspiracy is really what is happening out in the ocean. And we've both seen this with our own eyes, uh, you know, factor of five. You know, we've seen the destruction that's taking place every time we go out and campaign. We don't go out and campaign as much anymore as we did in the early years, but we hear from our crews that it is just getting worse and worse. So it is really, really important that there is a document, uh, a documentary like Seaspiracy out there that can show to the general public what's really happening out in the ocean. So I'm very, very happy that, uh, that, that Lucy and Ali made this documentary because I really believe that it's time that yeah, it's a wake up call for the masses, for the, for the general public to see situation that we've been seeing for a very long time and it's time for a change and we see that change happening here in uh, in Africa with our partner countries where you know the, the countries that we've been active in we see that the uh, the fish populations are bouncing back because of our patrols uh, that the ecosystems are becoming healthy again so it's 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 really it's possible to, to fix this it's really it just you know, you just need to, to be able to, to work together with governments. And that's really the mission that we have currently to work together with governments to make sure that these areas receive protection and to make sure that we can expand the areas that have protection. Uh, we really need to get more marine parks in the world, more marine protected areas, uh, more than the, effectively we have less than 1% that is actually patrolled right now, that's actually controlled right now, stop illegal activity. So that needs to become uh, much, much, much more. Uh, thank, thank you very much for the introduction, Andrew, and uh, Congressman, Admiral, it's, it's an absolute honor to, to share this panel with you. Um, uh, because the Admiral mentioned Antarctica and the small-scale fishermen and, and the, effects in, of, uh, the effects on their livelihoods and their lives by industrial fishing, I thought I'd connect those two points in telling a story as to how Sea Shepherd ended up in West Africa. About six years ago, uh, Sea Shepherd decided to track down the most notorious poaching vessel in the world. It was an Interpol listed, wanted, an internationally blacklisted fishing vessel called the Thunder that during a 10 year poaching career had made an illicit profit of about $60 million fishing illegally for Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish down in the Southern Ocean. This was a vessel that was the subject of a number of different workshops it was on all of these blacklists and yet no government was able to stop this ship. It would repaint constantly, it would change its flag and registry, um, it would leave port under one name and then as soon as it had left the territorial sea it'd be operating under another name. We set sail uh, from Australia and after about two and a half weeks of searching found the thunder operating in the most remote area of water in the world, an area that, that the Admiral is very familiar with. This is an area called the Benzari Bank. We refer to it as the Shadowlands. 
of the Southern Ocean, about two weeks sailing from South Africa, two weeks sailing from, from Australia. When we found the thunder, what began was what would become the longest maritime pursuit in history. We tried to place this vessel under a citizen's arrest. We told them to report to port. Uh, they refused uh, that instruction. And so we chased them for 110 days, covering three oceans and 11,000 nautical miles, until finally about 80 nautical miles southwest of the small island state of Sao Tome and Principe in the Gulf of Guinea, the captain of the Thunder, unable to shake our pursuit, decided to sink his own vessel in an ill-fated bid to destroy the evidence on board. And I remember standing on the bridge of my ship watching the Thunder sink and thinking out of all the places that this captain could have sunk his own vessel, why did he choose the Gulf of Guinea? And when we later handed him, handed, we rescued the 40 crew members of the Thunder, we handed them over to the Sao Tome Coast Guard. And when we saw the, the capacity of the Sao Tome Coast Guard, we saw that the small river iron patrol boats they had, had a range of about 20 nautical miles, a quarter of the distance to where the Thunder sank. So we knew that no, the captain of the Thunder knew that no Navy or Coast Guard was going to come and salvage the ship. Nobody was gonna come with submersible pumps to keep that ship afloat. And so the captain of the Thunder decided to sink his ship in the Gulf of Guinea for the same reason why the region is a hotbed for drug trafficking, for transshipment, for illegal fishing, for human trafficking, namely that there's inadequate monitoring control and surveillance. As we were chasing the Thunder up the west coast of Africa, I was in contact with a num number of governments asking if any of them would be able to intervene and, and take over this citizen's arrest and bring the ship into port to face justice. And the only country that got back to me was Gabon, where Alex and I are now. And the Gabonese authorities said that if the Thunder entered their waters, then the ship would, would be arrested. After the sinking of the Thunder, um, I traveled to Gabon. I met with the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Fisheries, and, and the Minister of Environment. And we signed the first of many agreements that we now have, these public-private partnerships with coastal and island states, whereby we provide a ship, we provide the crew, and we provide the fuel to run joint offshore patrols. And our government partner provides the law enforcement agents with the authority to board, inspect, and arrest vessels. And these partnerships to date have led to the arrest of 67 vessels for illegal fishing and other fisheries crime. Ali and Lucy's movie talk about the problem of overfishing. And if we're going to talk about overfishing, we have to talk about illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, which is about 20% of the global catch of fish. If we want to address the issue of global fishing, then we have to address IUU fishing, where we already have the laws in place to actually bring that problem to an end. And yet there are laws on the book, but what is lacking is oftentimes the enforcement capacity to do something about it. So what we're hoping to do here in, in West Africa is continue to expand on the model that we created, working with capacity building and capability building to turn back the, the sea of destruction that is in the movie Sea Spiracy. Because the reality is that 90% of the world's fish is actually caught in the waters of coastal states. Fish congregate around sea mounts, along coastlines, on continental shelves, which means that we really do need governments, state actors to take back the seas. And where states don't have that capacity, then they can rely on NGOs, Sea Shepherd in particular, to try to fill that, help fill that law enforcement vacuum. Peter, what a great story. Uh, I, I hadn't realized that connection and, and it makes perfect sense. It, it, it shows exa exactly why this is so important and why you, why you chose there. So thanks for that, that note. Uh, Ali and Lucy, uh, thank you for your work in putting, putting together this movie. Uh, we'd love to hear, hear you know, how it's been going since you finished the movie and, and the reception it's got, but also what were your motivations for doing this and, and why, uh, why do you think that this is important to bring to, uh, to an audience in, predominantly in, in Washington, D.C. And, and policymakers? Well, thank you so much for, for having us on this call. Uh, it's a real honor to speak to you. Um, for us, I think I speak for both Lucy and I, we, we really started this journey from a place uh, of ignorance, like, like Congressman Peter Welch acknowledged so eloquently. We believe that the oceans were this indestructible territory that nothing humans could ever do could ever harm the seas. It's covering 70% of our planet, home to 80% of our life, and nothing we could ever do could ever impact it. 
But slowly, slowly, we began to realize that humans were having a really detrimental impact on our oceans, starting with plastic pollution, which is something we, we've all become familiar with. But really, as the journey progresses, we learned that there's a more illicit, overwhelming industry that's the leading threat to our oceans, and that was the fishing industry. And learning about the, the ramifications that this industry was having on species extinction and habitat loss and its impact on coral reef ecosystems and, and large species in our oceans, and even the human impact as we began to learn when we went down to uh, West Africa, to Liberia with Sea Shepherd, we were able to really witness what was happening to these incredible ecosystems uh, as a result of the illegal fishing that's happening there from these heavily subsidized uh, European and predominantly Chinese fishing vessels. And, and, that's in, and that impact on the coastal communities that relied on that fish for sustenance. And further on, late, later learning about the, the slavery issue that we found uh, and speaking to slaves who had been at sea for you know, sometimes six years and then 10 years and, and just the horrors that they witnessed, witnessing their fellow crewmates being thrown overboard and, and drowned and, and feeling sorry that their parents would never know about their son's death at sea. And, and just the levels of abuse that are so systematic and actually being covered up in some cases uh, in, in areas in Southeast Asia, um, where even the local authorities were involved in it. However, this is something that we learned was a global issue. There was a study that showed that uh, human rights abuses and slavery was in the fishing industry was uh, apparent in, evident in about 47 countries, I think we found. Um, and so this is a global issue. And um, you know, it, it's something as Admiral William Fallon uh, said, it's like the Wild West, it's out of sight, out of mind. And it, for us, it was extremely difficult to really piece together this puzzle, this story, to try and, and try and understand what was really happening to our seas. And I guess it's, it's been phenomenal to see the response. And, and maybe Lucy, you want to talk about the response that we've had from the release on Netflix? Okay, um, thank you so much for having us here. Um, it's really a privilege to, to sure. be on here with everyone. Um, yeah, the response we weren't, we really weren't expecting the response that we got. It's been really overwhelming. Um, and it just really is, is really encouraging that the world is ready for, for a message like this. And, and people are now, you know, getting educated and aware that we're, we're at a, a tipping point, we're in a crisis and we need to urgently, um, you know, do something about it. Um, and I just want to add, I mean, Ali gave a pretty good summary of, of the film there, but I just also want to add that um, we wouldn't have got in such a lot of this without Sea Shepherd's um, collaboration um, as well. So um, it really is out of sight, out of mind in a lot of ways. So Sea Shepherd were really um, great mm -hmm. giving us insight into this, um, into what's actually going on out there. It's great, thank you. I, you know, thinking through see, all of your, your comments, uh, including the congressmen's too, at the beginning, it, it, this, this concept of out of sight, out of mind is really important. And, and you mentioned the, the seas are 70% are of, of the world's surface. And, it, you know, it's a huge area. And of course, it's, it's out of sight for, for most of us. Uh, so much of, of industrial society, of course, is out of sight. But I have a question here uh, from Bob Barnes. I, I suspect actually this is General Bob Barnes, uh, who we know, some uh, a, a uh, army general. And he, he says electric monitoring devices on board fishing vessels. And this get kind of maybe gets to, to the bigger question of the, the idea now that with electric monitoring devices, satellites, maybe this question is, is best for the Sea Shepherd team. Um, how is technology enabling a better monitoring, uh, better ability to, to help you all uh, and is there things that, that particularly the, the U.S. government can do to help support these uh, electric monitoring? And you know, should should placing technology on board all fishing vessels for their catch be, to be certified become an international requirement? Should the U.S. provide funding to partner nations for this this sort of technology? Are there things like this that can and should be do, done now that perhaps wouldn't have been possible even a decade ago? Um, is that, shall I start that question? I, if possibly? you'd like to start and then we'll turn yeah. it to the Sea Shepherd team. Sure, go ahead. So currently there's uh, several initiatives that are working to, to track these boats and uh, you know, keeping, keeping track of their satellite navigation systems. And also uh, for boats that are not using these, these tracking systems, using uh, the lights uh, on the boats at nighttime, using satellite data to collect the movement of these ships. Uh, and I believe that there's even uh, talk of AI being used to, uh, to even track these boats beneath cloud coverage. To me, 
because the oceans, the, the high seas are out of the jurisdiction of, of any one country, to me, there's, there's a tragedy of the commons happening with it. And so the, the governance is the big issue. You know, having, having Sea Shepherd out there is, is phenomenal, but we need more, you know, they need more vessels and we need to be able to have eyes around the, around the ocean and satellite navigation and AI is one of the things that I'm actually most hopeful for is actually going to be able to track these vessels so we understand what's happening. But I think uh, Peter and Alex will probably have more to speak on, on that, I, I think. Yeah, Peter and Alex, how, how has technology changed? You've been doing this for, each been doing this for over a decade. How has technology as it advances changed the, the impact here? Yeah, indeed, we have uh, we have we have used technology in our campaigns. Um, for instance, I was the uh, director of the Galapagos uh, from 2007 until 2013, and one of the projects we did there is we built a uh, a network of automatic identification systems (AIS), which uh, all vessels now need to have in the Galapagos. Not not just all the fishing boats, but all the speed boats and tourist boats as well. That increases the security uh, of the people on board those vessels, but it also shows exactly where each vessel is at all time. Now that's a national park, so it was fairly easy to accomplish that. But we need to lift the veil of secrecy that's happening on board the fishing vessels. So we need to install cameras, we need to have detectors on board. So we need to know what's happening on these fishing vessels. Like an example, uh, if we if we inspect a fishing vessel, a tuna a person a person a tuna vessel, for instance. Um, they have a, 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 catching, a catch log when they, in which they write how many sharks they catch on each trip, on each catch, and it's always empty. And the minute we come on board, all of a sudden there's 20 sharks in that catch. Well, that's suspicious how it's possible that you haven't caught any sharks in two years, and the minute we come on board, there's 20 sharks. So clearly there's this, this bycatch that they're not reporting. So if that would be detected constantly, if there would be technology available that we could actually see what's going on at, in real time on all these fishing vessels, then they would have to work much harder in order to, uh, to follow regulations and, and also to get their catch levels up to speed because they're also over, uh, under reporting their catch. And they're allowed to catch 50 tons and they're actually catching tenfold that much because nobody's checking it. And, and Andrew, I'll, I'll just add, thank, thank you for your question, General Barnes. Uh, Technology has really been a game changer, but it's not the solution to every problem. As, as Admiral Fallon knows far better than I do, a, intelligence has to be actionable. And a lot of times, whether it's satellite imagery or optical imagery, or if it's electronic information that's being mm -hmm. transponded, um, if, if the coastal and island states don't have the ocean going assets that can act on that information and actually intercept a suspicious vessel or have the capacity to board that suspicious vessel, then technology oftentimes just reinforces the, the, the the knowledge that there is a problem out there. Um, I think there's a tendency in, in the West when we're supporting other countries that have economic resources that are stretched, that we bring in these technological solutions when the reality is that the Rangers, the Coast Guard sailors, what they're still using firearms from the Soviet Union from the 1970s or 1980s, or they don't have, they don't have socks and boots. And so technology isn't going to solve every single problem. The, the issue with AIS and automatic identification systems and VMS vessel monitoring systems is that uh, these transponders can be turned off and, and these vessels then become what are known as dark ships and we have dark fleets in particular the, in particular the Chinese distant water fishing fleet operating in the Pacific. These are vessels that engage in GPS spoofing and give off false information as to where they're located or they give up false identities because the information in the automatic identification system is actually inputted by the user. And so they can claim to be any vessel they want to be unless you have the ability to actually intercept them at sea and, and read the name on the hull, board the vessel, compare the name on the hull with the names and, and information on the documents on board. So I think we have to be very careful with technology. It, it's, it's a force amplifier. Mm -hmm. it, it can definitely make us more effective at sea but it does not replace traditional policing and traditional law enforcement methods. We always need enforcing. Without enforcement, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's just information. Yeah, you need-, need And of course, control. we would love to have more vessels out there. Uh, we currently have nine ships out there, but it's already, we're already juggling too many balls at the moment. <laughs> uh, but we're definitely always trying to get more ships, uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's hard work. But, but that, that te technology can make us more effective. And, and yep. that's why if AIS is a great thing and we need all vessels transmitting on AIS because then 
we know which vessels to use our target with our limited financial resources. If there are five vessels off the coast of, of Gabon, four of them are transmitting on AIS, but one vessel isn't transmitting anything. We only have one vessel that can intercept. We know to go for the dark target. So it, it definitely helps narrow down a, a search and helps you be more effic effective and precise. But again, it's not the end all solution. Admiral Fallon, I, I have a question here uh, specifically for you. Uh, you know, you've noted that that this uh, this issue is particularly a it's a Coast Guard uh, issue, not a Navy issue. Um, and they uh, the question here is uh, how uh, effective uh, do you think the U.S. government ship rider program, run by the U.S. Coast Guard and supported by the U.S. Navy, is is their capacity to, to expand it? And you know. What are you? What has been your experience? You know, uh, they they mentioned the the um, the fleets, the the Chinese distant water fishing fleet. What's your experience in seeing these in the Pacific and, and how this works? Several comments. Uh, first of all, the Coast Guard is the uh, for the United States of America is the law enforcement agency at sea, uh, not the Navy. This is a a roles and missions uh, uh, hard line. And uh, the Coast Guard is tasked with uh, that mission. However, their ability to conduct it in the face of the size of the problem is uh, very, very problematic. They're, they're dwarfed. So there are thousands and thousands of fishing vessels out there and increasingly sophisticated uh, and large and mechanized. And they, uh, they take advantage of all the latest technology. Uh, the ability of the U.S. Coast Guard to monitor these fleets, and they try to, and, and uh, do, do a superb job with the resources they have, but they're just not enough resources, and they're stretched thin. You know, there's a big push right now because of the, uh, the melting of the Arctic ice to have a much greater presence up there uh, in the Arctic with the Coast Guard, okay? So that's going to take uh, money and, uh, and manpower and uh, there's going to be a tug of war going on as to who, who gets that. But uh, from what I've seen, the, um, the collusion, if you would, um, of some uh, national governments uh, with the illegal activity that goes on here is, uh, is something that aids and abets the, um, the negative criminal activity, uh, is what I call it, that, that goes on. And uh, I've seen... Uh, examples uh, in the South Pacific with the smaller, uh, less capable nations. Uh, it isn't just their vessels, their inability to monitor their seas, but uh, uh, the fact that they have weak governments and they're susceptible to corruption. They're susceptible to bribes. And uh, I've seen it many times where uh, uh, a fishing fleet, a Chinese fleet, for example, their, their uh, deep ocean fleet will move into this, these areas and uh, they'll work them over pretty well, and there's just basically nobody there to stop them. Uh, there are no resources available to, uh, to blow the whistle on them and, and rein it in. Uh, one of the things that I advocate strongly for the navies and maritime forces of other countries, particularly the smaller countries, is to put an emphasis on uh, what's called MDA, Maritime Domain Awareness. And this is something that's uh, particularly helpful uh, to not just the countries themselves, where they they get an idea of what's out there. So if they're if they had an ability to monitor their uh, EEZs, uh, economic zones, out to 200 miles uh, from their land masses, uh, they could make a huge dent or an impact on the potential illegal and uh, unreported, unregulated fishing, for example. But it would also be helpful in other things too search and rescue and, uh, and general awareness of what's going on. Uh, it's not grossly expensive. it will be much more useful in my opinion than, than buying guns and, and bullets and, uh, and warships. And I think it would be uh, very, very helpful to these countries to, to make investments there first and foremost. But the key thing uh, that is necessary is cooperation between countries uh, to try to enforce uh, these regulations that have been agreed uh, in large part by mass meetings of countries. Uh, they know what the standards are, but uh, again, the enforcement, as 
uh, Peter just mentioned is, is really lacking and uh, it's an area that needs to be bolstered. So we can help ourselves. For example, the issue came up early on of UNCLOS, the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. U.S. hasn't ratified it. Um, personally, uh, it's uh, pretty egregious that we have not done so. I know that every, every leader of the U.S. Navy for going back 30 some years has been of the same mind. Uh, it's pretty ridiculous that we haven't, and, uh, but, but we haven't been able to politically get it done uh, in the Senate. Uh, why would this be helpful? Because we would then be actually part of the solution. We would have a seat at the table uh, where we could sit down with, with uh, other countries and try to affect some of these regulations and the enforcement of these regulations that would be helpful in improving the health of the seas as well as the overall stability and security of, of countries in the maritime domains around the world. Thanks, and, and uh, you mentioned maritime dom domain awareness, but we have a question here, very specific here on uh, statutory authorities to both Title 10 and Title 22 of US code related to providing security assistance to allied and partner nations. Um, do you think that should be amended to specifically include authority to provide assistance and training to assist those nations in combating IUU fishing? Is this, should this become a, uh, a very specific part of U.S. Um, partnership and, and alliances with our, our partners around the world? It's, it's one of the initiatives that uh, might be very useful. Again, uh, you have priority challenges and priorities. There are a lot of things on the plates up there uh, of our, our leaders right now. Uh, yeah. This is certainly one of them, uh, but it's one that uh, could make a difference. Uh, has to be uh, uh, a trade-off, of course, in what resources are made available to do these things. But um, in my experience, uh, when you uh, try to find ways that would be uh, things that would be useful and helpful, uh, particularly to, to uh, smaller countries with uh, less capabilities, these kind of things stand out that, that might be uh, really worthwhile. Again, the, the Navy, U.S. Navy, uh, because of the law enforcement regulations of the country, uh, we looked at the Coast Guard to help with these things, and uh, they, they carry the brunt of this. Uh, but again, part of the engagement with folks all over the world, what is it that you need? How can we help you? And if we can put resources available uh, that might be of value, then we ought to be doing it. Thanks, Admiral. Um, to the Sea Shepherd team, if there were any specific things um, that would be helpful in your work from uh, Americans, from the U.S. government, what what would it be? Would it, you know there there has been some recent efforts in Congress. There was a, an amendment to the Defense Authorization Act last year that uh, required more reporting on IUU fishing around the world, identifying countries that are bad actors. And there's a an an, uh, semi-annual uh, report that, that NOAA does uh, identifying bad actors. But what, what are some maybe specific things that, that you'd like to see um, if the American government wanted to do something, if they cared about this, what, what is there to do? I Thank you for that, Andrew. I think it's worth acknowledging that the United States has been a real world leader in the fight against IUU fishing. Uh, just uh, six, seven years ago, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime declared illegal fishing as transnational organized crime. And that was a US led initiative. The United States was one of the major funders of Project Scale, the fisheries crime division of the International Criminal Police Organization in, in Lyon, France under the Environmental Subdirectorate. And that was largely financed by the United States together with partners in Canada and Norway and, and, and elsewhere. Here in West Africa, US Fish and Wildlife and USAID does an incredible amount of work in assisting national park authorities to protect marine parks, especially here in, in, in Gabon. So there, there, is a, there is a lot that the US is doing, but the US does need to, to do more. A, a friend of mine, uh, did testimony to, to, US, to the US Congress maybe 10, 15 years ago, where he said that one of the big issues with why we need to increase fishing vessel inspections, even in the United States, is that we're so often used to seeing the same fishing vessel leaving port and coming back the 24 hours later and the vessel just doesn't get inspected. If you come into US waters with a merchant vessel, you 
clear immigration and customs, and sometimes there's a very thorough port state inspection. But when it comes to domestic fishing vessels, people are just used to seeing these vessels come in and out. And it's not always clear who they may be meeting out at sea. And if one to 2% of these vessels are actually being inspected, then an increase in inspections would actually assist with, with national security. So illegal fishing does have to really be prioritized more as a national security issue for that reason. When the terrorist attacks happened in Mumbai over 12 years ago, it's important to remember that the terrorists actually entered India on, on board a fishing boat. And that fishing boat was able to easily enter uh, Indian waters because again, fishing vessels don't raise the types of flags that merchant vessels raise. There are vessels that are engaged in trade here in West Africa. They'll go between port and port, but don't have any fish on board and yet they're fishing vessels. And it's very likely that they're moving drugs or moving guns because again, people don't react in the same way to a fishing vessel as they do to a merchant ship. So I think we need to see more fishing vessel inspections in the US and we need to see a continued commitment of the United States in funding and supporting efforts globally to see illegal fishing as transnational organized crime. And, and I'd love to see a continued support of Interpol's project scale. I think they do a phenomenal work in, in helping countries whose economic resources are stretched to connect the dots between illegal fishing, uh, tax evasion, uh, fraud, forgery, and all the, other um, all the other convergence crimes that takes place when an illegal fishing event occurs. Thanks. Very, very specific and 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 important. I, this is this is something that that the U.S. government can and should do something about. And and I, I think you're right to 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 say that you know we have to get our own house in order as well. This isn't just something that happens all the way around the world. This is something that we have to make sure that that our own our own fisheries at home are are policed and and maintained. Um, you know, uh, very important point. Um, Ali and Lucy, your your, um, your film is important uh, in that it it reaches a broad audience and uh, and I think it, it, it for that that point it, the the key to this may not actually be you know solely government action. It's also about the marketplace. It's about people buying fish and buying and selling you know fish. You know we we kind of. You kind of get to a point at the end of the the movie where where you say you're you're going to give up on on uh, fish overall. What if people aren't aren't willing to do that? Uh, what if you know we somebody mentioned a congressman mentioned at the beginning that you know we have this uh, we're told by health health uh, our our doctors to eat more fish. Uh, how do we deal with this? Um, if uh, you know, what, what sort of marketplace measures are there? If somebody cares about this issue, watches your movie, wants to do something about this, what, what sort of marketplace uh, effects are there to, to try to affect the, the fishing industry around the world? Absolutely. Yeah, so the, although there are huge things the governments can be doing, uh, like maybe challenging uh, the amount of subsidies going to fishing vessels, enforcing marine protected areas free from fishing, consumer choice plays a huge role in it. And um, you know, like we said in the film, like we we no longer eat marine life, and we've moved towards a plant-based diet, and it's one of the best decisions we've had, uh, we've made. Um, but for those people who 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 aren't ready to do it, I think we're going to find it that it's going to be easier and easier to move in that direction. We've seen within the United States the 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 Beyond Burger, for example, and, and these sort of synthetic uh, animal protein that is meeting the same nutritional level that that people are, are requiring, and so we're getting more and more of that happening with plant-based seafood. And I think we're going to see more of that moving forward. Um, but absolutely, you know, other than that, you know, even even shifting to a, a meal or a couple of meals a week toward that direction of a plant based a plant based meal is going to be great, and it's going to be one of the most powerful things everyday people can do to reduce their impact on our oceans. It's, it's going to be a phenomenal direction that we will move in. Even yeah, one meal a week, one day a week, it's going to be amazing to do. Yeah. Um, I just want to add one thing to that would be. Sure. If if people are not ready to obviously go in that direction, which probably is the majority of people, I think transparency is something that's really got to be focused on at all stages of the supply. Um, so whether that's at the, the fishing end or the buying end and, and in the middle, sometimes you've got these, you know, NGOs or um, sustainable fishing and people, you know, putting labels on it. I think just people are interested in more transparency because there is a difference between illegal caught fish and 
a small scale, you know, sort of that there, there is a lot of variation. So I think transparency, I'm not, I haven't thought about how that will be implemented necessarily, but I just think it's a really important thing for consumers to have that knowledge to, to, to try and make the right decision. Yeah, thank you. I, and I think it's it, it's important to note how, how many middlemen there are throughout the pro this process. So it's, it's almost quite difficult to get this um, transparency and, and everything. Um, we have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Add something about the uh, nutritional value of fish. That's doctors keep saying that you should eat fish because it's healthy, whereas the oceans are yeah, the most polluted part of our planet. As you know, it's full of uh, heavy metals, PCBs. So the fish is becoming more and more polluted, as is the marine environment. And a lot of the uh, nutrients that the, the doctors uh, prescribe that are in fish are actually found in seaweed. Mm. Uh, but, but the toxins are also present in seaweed, but to a much lower level. Mm. So by eating seaweed, for instance, you're getting the same nutrients and less pollutants. So it's mm. not entirely correct that we keep saying this fish is healthy for you because it no longer is. Interesting. Um, we have a question here from uh, Layla, who says, um, do you all think that, that stricter regulations on the mar marketing of particular species, see, she particularly, particularly uh, mentions toothfish, and you talked about Patagonian toothfish before, which of course is marketed as Chile Chilean sea bass in stores, right? Uh, and I, I saw it recently in my store at 32 $32 a pound or something like that. So quite, quite high priced, uh, fetching a high value. She also mentions uh, bluefin tuna, uh, these things that, that fetch these high prices globally around the world. Um, you know, they're commonly found on menus, dis despite these countries, you know, many countries do have advocacies for healthier oceans. Is this about misinformation? Uh, or this is, is this, you know, what, what accounts for this discrepancy between, you know, we know that these are um, uh, are fisheries that are depleted and already uh, in many ways endangered. I mean, the bluefin has been in, a, in, the, um, in the headlines for, for years now as, as critically endangered, and yet it still is being fished and sold. Um, what, what accounts for that? Maybe for you guys, uh, the, the Sea Shepherd team. And, and it's interesting that you mentioned the bluefin tuna because there is a bit of a myth that every fisherman who goes out to sea has an invested interest in ensuring that that fish population can be fished for all generations, for their children and their children's children to fish. And we forget a, a very simple economic premise, which is that scarcity creates value. Mm -hmm. And there are companies in, in Japan that have stores of bluefin tuna going back many, many years. And the value of those stores of bluefin tuna would just go up exponentially if the bluefin tuna were to go extinct in the wild. So I, I, I think it's a, a big problem in that we do see fish on menus under different names, but we, we have this huge disconnect about where these fish have actually come from. And, and also th there's been through, through many, many years, this push by many, non uh, many NGOs for you know, sustainable seafood guides and recommendations of fish. And um, those recommendations can be quite dangerous because they can have unintended effects. And the example I would give is that with uh, salmon and Ali and Lucy talk about farm salmon in, in their film. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of environmental NGOs uh, that were pushing for farm salmon to be an alternative to wild salmon to protect wild salmon populations. And so there were lots of advertisements out there trying to get people to choose farm over wild. The, the consequence of that is that farm salmon consumption increased, but so did wild salmon consumption. Mm. Because people were seeing advertisements for salmon and that's what they were equating with. So, um, but Ali and, Ali and Lucy, you, you might have a lot more to contribute on this as this, you yeah. invested in this for many, many years. Yeah, Ali, Lucy. Yeah, absolutely. It goes beyond that, it go, it, absolutely. So by the, the reason why I have resistance to saying, well, let's not eat this fish, but let's eat that fish is because when you walk into the supermarket, you know, if it's the one that you went there to buy isn't there, you're gonna buy the other one and you end up marketing all of them. And it's incredibly hard to know what is and isn't sustainable. When we went to the gold standard, uh, you know, organization behind the MSC blue label, and they, they turned us down into, they wouldn't speak to us because they knew we were going to ask these straightforward questions because these organizations find it really hard to define what sustainable fishing even is. We went to the head of the European Union commissioner for fisheries and the environment, asked him what sustainable fishing was. 
and he was left with not much of an answer. And it, it goes across the board, even to the dolphin safe tuna labels that you find on, on, on cans of tuna, finding out that while they can't guarantee that dolphins aren't killed because, hey, it's just out far out of sea and you, you can't tell what goes on. And the observers that are there to make sure that no dolphins get killed are barely there in the first place. And when they do get there, uh, they can get bribed, as, as Admiral William, uh, William Fallon has said, you know, the bribery is a big issue out at sea. Um, and so, yeah, this is why a clearer message for consumers is uh, to move towards uh, the sort of plant-based diet side of things from a consumer level, along with those government actions that we can try and, uh, you know, uh, encourage from, you know, the marine protected areas and the subsidies issue. Um, but yeah, across the board, we were finding that what seemed to be sustainable, what you'd think to be sustainable, ended up being very much not sustainable. Admiral okay. Fallon. Um, yeah, a couple of thoughts. Um, one, uh, so I don't have any idea what sustainable uh, fishing is or sustainable consumption, uh, but uh, when folks uh, look at this movie, I think they're going to start to, to wonder about uh, some of the underlying assumptions that uh, go into these things. I think for all of us, the entire society, um, it's pretty clear that we're going to have to change some basic behaviors very difficult to do you you pick pick an area and uh you know how how stupid is smoking but it's been many many decades to push that down and uh you know you, you can look at all the uh the evil addictions in the world but uh this is really critical because the oceans are uh they're basically us uh, it's water that's uh, 70 percent of the land mass of the planet and it's uh, about that percentage of us and so they're inextricably linked and the health of one and the other are are very very much uh, paired so uh, to give you an idea of the difficulty this just in our own backyard here in the washington area uh, beautiful chesapeake bay uh, has gone through uh, decades of of uh, up and down uh, reaction to shortages of fish stocks. And so the authorities will uh, recognize it usually after a lot of uh, a lot of pushing and prodding. And they'll enact some fiat that says we've got to throttle back, cut back. One thing about the ocean, it's very resilient, um, despite all the abuse it gets uh, that both of the, the oceans themselves and the fish stocks uh, have a way of bouncing back. But at any rate, here in the Chesapeake Bay, we've gone through countless cycles of overfishing, enforcing strict regulations, fish start to come back. Ah, look at that, success. The regulations get weakened, watered down, and, and off we go. And, and often things that are little known. So there's a fishery called the Menhaden fishery in this, in this bay. It's, it's a small fish, uh, uh, a foot or so uh, or smaller. Uh, they used to be very, very populous. They're vacuumed up by uh, industrial strength uh, ships, a small fleet of them that basically can vacuum the whole bay. And, uh, and they're blatantly overfishing. And so uh, even though the authorities recognize the overfishing, uh, to date, it's been pretty much a slap on the wrist and, and uh, the, these problems continue. So uh, this is an area that's actually pretty visible. And uh, particularly you take a couple of species like the the so-called rockfish, the striped bass, and uh, and bluefish, and oysters, and things that are pretty common here, and one would think that okay, here's the evidence. Now let's react to it in the right way and, and fix this. And uh, it it doesn't happen very easily, or very dramatically, or very successfully. So um, we have a big problem. Uh, and I, I'm back to first steps. Awareness I think is absolutely critical. Uh, this movie, I think. Sheds, uh, puts a spotlight on some of these things ought to be pretty revolting to people when, when they see it. And, uh, and then we have to get organized to actually have an impact uh, to turn around some of these practices. And we're all a part of it one way or another. And uh, it, it's gonna be a long haul, but it's something worth doing. And so we just need to get on with it, try to get as many allies as we can and uh, elicit help from the, from the politicos, from the Congressman and his colleagues up on the Hill, as well as, uh, uh, recreational fishermen uh, runs the whole gamut yeah. but uh, we need action and uh, talking about it is, uh, is a good start but it's not going to get it done we're going to have to get get stuff out there and I think the 
I could make a comment on Sea Shepherd. I'm not particularly familiar with all of your work, folks. I've, I've run across a couple of your vessels in different places, but it's a, it's a good adjunct to the, uh, the national and international law enforcement agencies and the degree to which you could uh, cooperate and do cooperate with them to share information and, and to help them, uh, I think is, uh, is the kind of thing that will be very useful. So uh, more power to you and hope you continue doing what you're doing. Thank you, Admiral. And thanks, thanks for those comments, uh, Admiral. And, and I'd note that, that ASP intends to, to continue our work on this, talking about it, uh, hosting events like this, and, and also proposing very specific policy options and very specific things that, that can be done to help solve the, the issue. Um, I want to actually come back to you, Admiral Fallon, here. Uh, I have a question from, from uh, Mr. Woody um, uh, asking about international tensions and conflict and, and disputes over fish. We've, we've seen this you know, in the past, there was Iceland versus European Union. And, you know, uh, uh, you've seen some up in the Arctic between Norway, EU and Russia. It's international tensions about who has rights to certain fishing areas. And of course, the, the prime example of this, of, of uh, EEZ rights and everything like this is the South China Sea and who has access and rights in those areas. What, what do you rate as the likelihood of disputes over fisheries, especially as you know, climate change changes where the fish are and where they migrate to, um, sparking any sort of broader international tensions? And, and um, you know, how, do you, how do you see the, the future playing out on this? Well, I can't handicap it, uh, put a hard number on it, but uh, you raise the point the infamous cod war back in the in the seventies with uh, Iceland and the UK uh, coming to, literally coming to blows over over fish. Uh, let's take one uh, prime example today: South China Sea, mm -hmm. where we have many claims and counterclaims uh, for various territories, EEZs, and so forth. Uh, the reality is it's overfished, and you have a vast uh, Chinese fleet. Uh, fishing vessels and other other vessels that are uh, helping them, if you would, and uh, and also uh, helping in other other areas to uh, demonstrate sovereignty and expanding that sovereignty. So, I think it's quite possible that you could uh, could have uh, an escalation of not just tensions, but uh, that could turn into something more significant for a couple of reasons. First, the, uh, the claims and counterclaims and, and the legalities and illegalities of that stuff. Uh, second, the uh, international push of nations to try to uh, demonstrate their claims, China with the artificial islands and uh, claiming uh, uh, the nine dash line and, and uh, pushing against other, other countries. And the third more fundamental thing is the actual fish fish themselves and the demand for seafood and the uh, need and the perception of that need to feed peoples in all these countries uh, combined to, uh, to a bit of a witch's brew out there. And the, uh, the sheer volume of vessels that are engaged in fishing and uh, whether it's legal or illegal uh, is having a detrimental impact. And I think uh, it, it's, uh, it's a really good point that was raised by the questioner that uh, we, we could have problems. And the only way we're gonna, gonna try to diffuse that, the only way that makes sense to me, I think, is to, is to actually have people sitting down and coming to agreement on uh, what kind of actions are gonna go on, what's gonna be tolerated, and how that's gonna be enforced. Yeah. Peter, a lot of the work that Sea Shepherd does is in the areas of the world that are Perhaps you could call them ungoverned spaces, you know, where or or less governed. There's not a um, there's not enough enforcement in West Africa, as you, as you mentioned, and places like that. What about areas though, where perhaps it's you know, do you guys get involved where there there is more sort of government intervention that that isn't necessarily beneficial? You know, this is something. Ali mentioned the uh, the over subsidizing of, of fishing fleets. Um, you know, some governments are you know actively undermining the global fisheries. Uh, how how does Sea Shepherd play in this? Are you you involved in this this at all? 
Off the coast of West Africa, the majority of fishing vessels that are encountered are either vessels belonging to the Chinese distant water fishing fleet or Chinese vessels with Chinese beneficial ownership that are locally registered in, in the countries that we're working with, or they're European Union vessels. And um, either they're flagged to a European Union country like Spain or France, or they are flagged to a flag of convenience, but the beneficial owner is in, in Spain. Mm. And the, the reason all of these vessels have congregated around West Africa is in part because of subsidies. So the Chinese distant water fishing fleet is at a massive overcapacity. Nobody knows for sure exactly how many of these vessels exist, but it's estimated to be as high as about 17,000. Fish populations off the coast of China have, have basically collapsed. You have a European Union fishing fleet that is at about 2.5 times the capacity of what they could quote unquote sustainably fish in European waters. Mm -hmm. And so because you have this tremendous overcapacity, these, the governments of these countries go to countries where the waters haven't historically been overexploited to then overexploit. And that's why you find these vessels in, off West Africa. Mm. The problem then becomes that if you're a local businessman who wants to start a, a fishing company in, in Gabon or in Ghana or someplace like that, you have to compete with the economic might of the European Union. The European Union is coming in, they're paying for a third of your fishing license fee. They're paying for, they potentially pay for the construction of your vessel or part of the construction of the vessel. They're giving you fuel subsidies. So you had a huge competitive disadvantage uh, in starting your own business. So all of these countries that have economic resources that are stretched, they open up their waters to uh, vessels from Europe and vessels from, from Asia because they don't have the capacity domestically. And then none of these foreign vessels off or many of these foreign vessels don't offload in the country whose waters they're fished in and therefore there's no transparency or accountability uh, whatsoever. Or so even one economic the, benefit. Right? Or the economic benefit. So these countries through these uh, fishing agreements, which is basically a fish for cash barter agreement, okay. get maybe five to 10% of what the value of the fish would be um, on the market in, in sure. the European Union. Um, so one of the things that we're able to do, as you mentioned so well, Andrew, the, the oceans are out of sight and out of mind. So we're able to bring the eyes of, of regulatory authorities out to the scene of the crime. Uh, we're able to ensure that fishing inspectors, we're basically transporting fisheries inspectors to the vessels that they've licensed to fish. They can see firsthand what are they catching? Are they being honest? Are they underreporting? What's the impact on other species? And a lot of times that allows our partner country to actually renegotiate these agreements, to lower the number of vessels that are licensed, to kick vessels out that are, are transgressors of laws. So it goes hand in hand. Yes, we're working with countries that have economic resources that, that are stretched. These countries are being exploited by very wealthy countries mm -hmm. that, that, are, that know that it's very unlikely that they're going to be inspected to circumvent the law. Yeah, yeah, it's ironic that that it's it's rich countries subsidizing this, and and thanks for for highlighting this, um, Ali Lucy. Uh, you've you've now got your movie out, and and it's getting getting responses around the world. What's next for you? What what's the next uh, step uh, as as we continue to look at this issue and and uh, and deal with it? Yeah, so we're going to be continuing to put out information over on our website and social media pages on this conspiracy and really going into a lot of the stuff that we weren't able to cover in the film. Um, for example, you mentioned the South China Sea and uh, the latest research I found was showing that 50% of the world's fishing vessels are operating just in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. And the fish population there since 1950 have been depleted around 95%. And in, I think in 2018, the Ch uh, China subsidized their vessels something like 7.2 billion in order to ensure that they could continue fishing further and further and catching uh, this fish. And what is essentially like a food security uh, uh, conflict issue down there, uh, where they're you know, invading these, in, these reefs and building military bases and these fishing vessels are actually like, you know, de facto, like, uh, they can be adapted into military vessels. There's a lot of conflict there. Just reporting on more of these issues that are just continuing to happen out at sea that we weren't able to cover in the film and make future documentaries uh, really highlighting stories of the nexus and the intersection of environmental and social issues. I think that that's that sounds like a great, great way to 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 pick up where you left off. 
Uh, and I'd also say a great place for us to, to leave off, off here. Um, I'll, I'm going to ask everybody, uh, Ali and Lucy, where can uh, people find out more about, uh, about the movie and about your, your work? So people can find more out uh, by visiting our website, uh, cspiracy.org. And we have a lot of information over on our Twitter, at cspiracy, and our Instagram, at cspiracy. And um, they can find more information out about the film there. But we encourage people to continue watching the film, sharing the film with their friends and family, and starting these discussions, uh, which I think is, is the starting point for, for creating change. Great. Alex and Peter, what about, what about C, C. Shepherd? Where can folks find out more about your work and, and uh, you know, help, help support you guys. Yeah, of course, people can find out about Sea Shepherd if you're located in the US uh, at the uh, Sea Shepherd US website, seashepherd.org, or for anybody outside the US, uh, you can find it on our global uh, page, seashepherdglobal.org. And they share the same information and uh, they both report both websites about our like, campaigns globally. Great. Admiral Fallon, any parting thoughts? I uh, salute uh, ASP for putting this program together and uh, encourage you to look for opportunities to increase awareness uh, through through these various venues. And uh, thanks to the participants, uh, very enlightening and very helpful and uh, headed in the right direction, I hope, if we can uh, get a little more momentum and uh, a few more people to understand what's going on, I think it'll uh, accelerate the the change which needs to happen. So thanks very much for allowing me to be a part of it. Thank you, sir. And, and we're going to continue to push on this. And, and I'd encourage folks watching to uh, take a look on our website, americansecurityproject.org. We're also on Twitter at AMSEC Project and on Facebook too. Um, please uh, engage with us and, and we'll, we'll continue to push on this certainly throughout this year and, and hopefully in, in an ongoing process. So so thank you all uh, for being with us. Again, it would be a, a huge round of applause. We've had a record audience here, 120 or more people throughout. Uh, so, so thank you to our panelists. Uh, thanks to, uh, to Congressman Welsh, who's, who's dropped off. Uh, and uh, hit us up on our website. So thanks very much.